Yo, 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 welcome back, welcome back to another episode of your weekly rundown with Kason and Rich Now I know you guys are used to Rich doing the intro, but unfortunately he could not be here with us for this episode But I do have a very, very, very special guest on the show with us today If you guys have been following the podcast for a while now, you know that we are huge Syracuse Orange fans here on the rundown And here with me today I have Matthew Gutierrez He's a staff writer for one of the biggest media platforms out there right now, The Athletic he covers Syracuse men's basketball and a little bit of football, and uh, I'm happy to have him on here today. Thank you for joining us today, Matthew. Kason, appreciate it. Happy to chat, help, really admire what you're doing, your your determination, work ethic, and uh, happy to help. Always down to chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, before we get into Syracuse and kind of some of the things that you do now, I kind of wanted to get into your background, just uh, kind of how you grew up in sports, some of your favorite sports growing up, just a little background about how you got into sports and things like that. I, I, I believe you grew up in New Jersey, right? Yep, grew up in, in New Jersey, uh, you know, pursued journalism from the get-go, starting in elementary school, um, always had a passion for, for reading. Uh, starting in middle school and, and through high school and, and stayed with the writing. Loved telling stories, interviewing, uh, you know, attacking a, a blank or document, right, and just kind of being able to explore and create something out of out of nothing, really. And, and it's just that creative process I always gravitated toward. Uh, and that, that drew me to Syracuse University, where I continued that uh, in college, and then where I'm at now with the athletics. So, yeah, definitely started in New Jersey covering, you know, a little bit of sports, some news, uh, and, and grew from there. Were you always a sports fan growing up, and did you play any sports growing up? Yeah, always uh, loved sports, man. You know, <laughs> baseball, basketball, even some flag football. You know, not I'm not a huge guy, so not too much football or anything. But loved, really loved basketball and baseball. Those are my favorite sports. Uh, like watching golf. Uh, sometimes I, you know, I appreciate soccer as well. I don't didn't play that, but yeah, I think you know, playing sports doesn't mean uh, it doesn't give you i don't think an advantage in working in sports whether it's journalism or just in sports in general but uh it doesn't help ha- doesn't hurt right you you have that background and uh, i was an athlete myself so i can hopefully relate to these guys and put maybe an, a- an ounce or two more than i otherwise would be able to so uh yeah started with new jersey playing baseball basketball yeah 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 definitely can you kind of talk about syracuse a little bit and kind of what drew you there and kind of because they know to be like the number one communication school in the nation. Is that one of the reasons why you wanted to go there? Yeah, no doubt. Um, that, that was, you know, it wasn't really on my radar initially. And then uh, a couple people had pointed me, you know, I wanted to study journalism. And they told me uh, Newhouse would be the place to be. So applied. Uh, wasn't in my top three. And then eventually it became my number one. And obviously it's the school I attended. So many great journalists, both broadcast and print, have gone to Syracuse, Newhouse schools, and sometimes not in Newhouse, but in Syracuse, you know, other schools at the university, but mostly Newhouse, which has um, tremendous facilities, good faculty, and, and most, above all, great hands-on experiences, as I'm sure, you know, you've gotten to know yourself, you're doing it right now, the, those kind of out-of-classroom reps go a long way in your development, um, with it, in any profession but especially journalism you need those those repetitions got those at Newhouse really enjoyed my time worked at the Daily Orange student newspaper covered basketball covered a bunch of sports but uh, most mostly men's basketball especially my last two years loved college basketball you know really appreciated having an open locker room for interviews after games that made such a huge difference in college you're able to learn uh, and, you know, at, at the Daily Orange, the student paper there, and there's a lot of great student newspapers and, and other outlets. Um, it's really a, prof- it's a, it's a professional atmosphere, even though for, for students. And that builds your skills early. It tests you. You get great editing early on, so the learning curve is steep right away. And, you know, that, that experience, plus just reading a ton on your own, makes you smarter. You ask better questions, and you write better and all that certainly helps and it makes it in the end it makes it more enjoyable you know when you're better and more confident you can then just kind of enjoy the game more have fun and, and then just write as a, as opposed to you know being a, you know when it's starting out right you're a little more stressed you're you're not sure how it's going to go but uh when you're 
when you've read a lot and, and practiced your writing over and over, like anything, I think it really helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely can agree with you because I, I, I go to the Miami now and I work for the student paper down there. And uh, they just do a good job of let you let, let you get the experience of kind of being in the back with the media and just, and just, just, just different things like that. But you guys uh, up at Syracuse kind of do something more interesting. You guys kind of let your... Uh, let your staff go to away games and stuff like that. So can you kind of talk about that experience, just uh, uh, being able to go on the road and then uh, some of your favorite places to visit? Yeah, I know that's <laughs> to the detriment sometimes to my class schedule slash homework, although you can try to get some things done on the road. Uh, we would travel to, I would say, 95% of the games, maybe 90. Uh, you know, occasionally we won't get to like a, a Wednesday night game mid-semester, you know, at Louisville. That can sometimes be a challenge, right, because we're going to be missing basically three days of school. Um, we don't always do that. But, yeah, we're, we're driving to everything just for budget. Or, or almost everything because of the budget so uh to kind of cut down on costs we'll drive to pittsburgh we'll drive sometimes to louisville i've driven to north carolina many times for a number of sports I've driven to boston from syracuse at odd hours of the night when you're tired you're uncomfortable you want to shower you want a meal whatever um and you know we're just doing it to to for the experience and it, it is a lot of fun listening to music and, and chatting and reading and writing. Um, and then as far as uh, Miami, that would obviously be a flight, right? It's, it's a little farther. So we have gone down to Miami, Florida State, being ACC schools like Syracuse. Um, and that's, that just goes into the, the broader broader theme of, of how the that kind of atmosphere forces competitive, you know, ness and we're always going to uh, push each other, right? Whether it's going to travel to a game on a weekend or, or a weeknight, or, or staying up late to finish a story, or right on deadline, or a feature. Um, the, the traveling inc- is included in all of that, so that's a, that's a tremendous experience for so many young journalists starting out. Yeah, 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 definitely. That's a cool experience because out of Miami, like I said, we we don't we don't get to do that. But uh, uh, before we get into the Syracuse key teams, I kind of wanted to ask you about like what were some of your favorite. What was one of your favorite things about Syracuse that was non sports related? Whether it was just one of your favorite places to go or maybe some of your favorite food from Syracuse as well as some of your non sports related favorite things. <laughs> well, food we can talk for hours, but certainly love a lot of uh, a lot of spots in Syracuse downtown and even in the surrounding uh, towns, there's some great local spots, you know, Italian, Mexican, um, Ethiopian even. There's, I mean, there's some great restaurants. Um, but this, you know, knowing this is not a food podcast, uh, you know, with Syracuse, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really pricey private school. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's extremely expensive, as a lot of colleges are getting now, these private ones. Uh, but aside from Newhouse, you know, really just... Enjoyed the the size of it is is nice if you're looking for kind of a medium sized school, but you know not too big. So, but it has the benefits of a big school with big athletics. Um, at the same time, it's not it's not that small, right? I didn't run into the same people over and over again. I think Miami kind of wrong, and and uh, you know the weather is rough but you get used to it and there's there's definitely a nice feel to it it's a mid-sized city so it's not a miami or new york or boston it's kind of away from the spotlight a little bit it's not in the news too much at the national level um and uh, you know all those factors make it make it a special place yeah i believe you got the syracuse around 2015 correct uh yep 20 august 2015 i enrolled do you did you have like a favorite team during your time being there? I know you you were kind of there for that twenty sixteen final four run. So do you have a like maybe your favorite team to cover during your time there, at Syracuse? Yeah, you know I'm not a fan, but as far as favorite team, just kind of as a as a basketball fan slash journalist outsider, I probably you know it's a, it's a tie between two, the seventeen. Eh, We'll give the edge to the 16 team because of the Final Four, but I would throw in there the 17-18 team, which was so-so for most of the year. Probably wasn't going to get in the tournament. Got in the tournament and made the Sweet 16. We covered that run to Detroit which and Omaha, Nebraska, which was pretty fun. A couple, couple marches ago when March Madness was, you know, what happened. And unfortunately, didn't this year. Um, and really special, you know, I thought that was a fun group. 
uh, to cover some some cool personalities, and they made a surprise run, which made it fun to cover. And then uh, probably takes the cake though is the 2015-16 Final Four team. If you got a chance to watch that, Kason, but that was uh, yeah four years ago now. Syracuse's second Final Four in four years. Some some good leadership on that team. Some young guys, some shooters. They weren't even talk about teams that weren't supposed to make it in the tournament. They weren't supposed to make it. They get the 10 seed, and then they, they make a run all the way to the Final Four. Uh, I did not cover that. I was only in my first year of college covering, um, uh, I believe I was in the softball beat at that time, just trying to build my basic beat writing skills. But uh, that was a, just from a, just to watch, you know, it was always neat to see a team go from, you know, a 10 seed to something like an Elite Eight or Final Four. Yeah, 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 I definitely remember that team and got to watch that team with uh, Malachi Richardson. Um, yeah, I definitely, definitely remember that run. Uh, there's actually a funny story about the 2018 team that made it to the uh, the Sweet 16 because uh, the day they went to the Sweet 16 to play Duke, I was actually uh, up at Syracuse taking a visit because uh, I myself was going to go to Syracuse. I actually have my uh, Syracuse jacket on right now that I, I bought from the bookstore when I went up there to visit. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nice man. That, that uh, yeah, that was. I'm trying to think. Probably mid mid to late March. It was. Uh, I believe it was a Friday that they played Duke. You know, and they they only lost by a few points. They were a couple missed alley oops away from going to the Elite Eight that year. Yeah, yeah I kind of wanted to get into uh, this year's team now. Uh, Coming to the year, a lot of people expect them to to to, uh, to have some shooters out there and be able to space the floor. But the team kind of had a lot of highs, a, a lot of lows, a lot of ups and downs. Sometimes they they be hot from three. Sometimes they they be cold for three for a couple games. So kind of, what did you see out there? And uh, just why 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 do you think that they they struggled this year? Uh, do you think it was just a lack of experience? Do you think uh, there's something along those lines? Why do you just think that the team was kind of struggling this year? Yeah, you know, they finished 18 and 14. Uh, they were so sorry, probably were not going to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, a mixture of things. Yeah, they had a younger group for sure. They're going to get four or five starters back next season. Elijah Hughes was obviously the, the star, and he's gone to the NBA. I mean, watching him was a privilege. 19 points a game. Super exciting player. They'll miss him. Uh, really, really neat story in his case. He was the number 200 recruit in his class. Talk about ratings not mattering so much. And then uh, led the ACC in scoring this past year. First team all ACC. Um, pretty neat for Elijah Hughes uh, and his rise in just two seasons at Syracuse after transferring from East Carolina but you know aside from him there was uh, there were some real ups and downs like you said I think the shooting was certainly something to pinpoint but more than anything it was it was the defense right this is a Syracuse team that usually the zone is is their is their bread and butter and it holds teams it's, it frustrates teams it, it they struggle to shoot they overthink it how to attack it they don't see the zone too much and this year the Syracuse zone uh, was I believe according to Ken Palm one of its worst it's ever been in a season as far as defensive metrics go Uh, points per game allowed the help defense wasn't always there they didn't really defend the perimeter that well Uh, so this team you know they scored a little bit they had some some decent shooters even though their percentages weren't high they had Quincy Garrier off the bench, Eliza Hughes, of course, and, and occasionally uh, some points inside. But uh, so fairly balanced. It wasn't terrible offensively at all, but the defense uh, struggled to pick up its slack, and that, that cost them in a number of games. So then you're looking at the difference between maybe a 22 and 10 season, which is an NCAA tournament berth, and what they ended with, which was 18 and 14. So that's only a. You know, three or four games could have gone differently had they defended it a bit, a bit better. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of happy you brought up Elijah Hughes because I kind of wanted to get into him a little bit. Can you kind of talk about his development that you you've seen from him over the years? Because I know he came in as a transfer from Easter. Uh, Carolina and uh he had to sit out his first year he had, he had the red shirt and then uh his second year he kind of comes in behind uh Tyus Battle and O'Shea Brousset and then this year he, he kind of has to be the, the the main guy and the star of the team so you can you kind of talk about his development that you've seen in him just just from his time here uh, at Syracuse yeah I mean he's uh it seems like you're, you're real well versed on, on keys maybe I should be asking you some questions <laughs> but uh you yeah, know Elijah comes in 
uh, sits out that first year due to NCAA uh, rules on transferring, which you know seemingly are going to be changing soon. But he sits out the 17-18 year, the Sweet 16 year. Um, you wonder how good that team would have been, right? If he were eligible, they probably make a, an even deeper run than the Sweet 16. Maybe even a, another surprise, you know, Elite Eight or Final Four. Who knows? He's, he can really shoot the ball. You know, initially thought he was going to be good. Had, did not think he'd be a first-team All-ACC player. Uh, and maybe the best player in the last, I don't know, five years at QS at least. Uh, All-around player at least. This is a guy who just straight-up balls shows up not necessarily a ferocious worker you know he's not one of those guys who's always in the gym doesn't need to do that uh he does what he needs and that's that's what works for him right he's, he's more of a game player uh he you know early on in practice i heard stories that he would dominate during certain stretches uh his redshirt year so he was a redshirt sophomore um at the time and or excuse me redshirt freshman and 6'6", six, six, he had some size, he was pretty thick, strong, um, so ha- kind of had an idea that he was going to come in and start, which he did, had no idea he would come in and, and dominate his second year, right, that first year at Cuse, he was more of a straight shooter, as you probably saw, he didn't really get to the rim too much, didn't take over, he was just a really good shooter, and then this past year, he turned into an, uh, do with everything, man, the chase down blocks, the rebounds, the passing, uh, and then the stuff that doesn't show up in the in the box score, besides the points, assists, and rebounds, and the shooting percentage, which was respectable, is is the ability to draw defensive attention, right? You can't really record that, um, but there were a lot of times he'd, he'd be doubled, or, or if not doubled, he'd be guarded by one guy, but two other guys would have a lot, you know, half their attention on Elijah, and then that opens up spots for other people because they're, defenders and paying as much attention to them so all that combined made him an outstanding player you know you could go certainly argue the best player in the ACC this past season and with him entering the draft is anything you may have heard or what you just think of maybe where where his range may be because I I think personally that if he can get with the right team he may be like the like the perfect fit especially with just the way the NBA is going with uh shooting threes and just spacing the floor no your point there is spot on um it's tough, right? He's not going to be a lottery. So outside of that, I don't think it matters a ton where he goes in the draft. Um, he certainly could go late first round if he gets real lucky with the right team. But he's probably, from what we've heard of the athletic, is probably going to go somewhere early to mid second round. Um, something Malachi Richardson said a couple a week or two ago on a on a actually in an interview with a former teammate of his. Uh, he pointed to the idea and Malachi was a former first round pick in 16 that it doesn't really matter so much where you go in the draft it's the team you're picked by and do they have a plan for you is it good timing you know there's so many factors outside of where you where you go in the draft um in his case is a perfect example he had some injuries uh you know there were a couple guys ahead of him so it was tough for him to make some strides uh, on the on the depth chart there um, so that that hurt with the Raptors so that hurt him whereas you know if Elijah can get in the right system you know Houston obviously a possibility I think the three and D uh, skills Elijah would bring he'd come in as a as a knockdown shooter I think he could certainly be a rotation player in the next couple years probably would need to spend some time in the G League like a lot of younger players but uh, I believe Elijah is 22 years old so He's not the youngest guy in the draft, but he's also uh, still relatively young with uh, a few a few real good years possibly ahead of him. Uh, so, you know, to answer your question, I think early to mid-second is likely where he ends up. And then, to your point, if he can get in a system where they want to give him opportunity, little bit on the wing he's a, he's a great wing player he uh he could really do some just uh have a really productive uh, nba career i think maybe not frontline starter or anything but but certainly uh a guy who can come in off the bench and give you really good minutes and with him leaving opens up a starting spot so i know that the syracuse still has uh quincy quincy garrier and then uh woody new woody newman coming in next year uh, so uh, who do you think may, may may get that starting spot yeah, you know, there's a couple options for sure. I think Quincy Garrier is a possibility. He was the sixth man last year, 6'7 forward. There's also Alan Griffin coming in, who is a transfer from Illinois, who will be a junior. Now, he might have to sit out 
because he's transferring, but he also may get a waiver due to the pandemic and the fact that he's moving closer to home. Uh, two factors, I think, will actually get him that waiver and get him immediate eligibility. Uh, if he does get eligible, I'd put Alan Griffin probably at the three. He's a perfect kind of fill-in for Elijah Hughes. Might not be exactly the same caliber player, but Alan Griffin can shoot the ball. Pretty good defender, and he's an athlete, which would be which would be perfect for the three spot. Uh, and if it's not him, I would, I would think Quincy Garrier slots in at the starting three. Uh, then everyone else is the same, right? Four or five excuse me, four or five starters are back, so not too much change there. And, you know, just one guy, you mentioned Woody Newton. One guy, would, he's, he's a pretty good player. He might not play a ton right away, but definitely by his sophomore year, I think he'll get some minutes. One guy who, who will play is Kadari Richmond. He's uh, from Brooklyn, not too far from you. And he comes in 6'6", guard. So he's a big kid, tall, athlete, defender. And he can really get to the rim, so I think he'll he'll get a lot of minutes off the bench in the backcourt. Yeah, I, I I just had read the story that you uh, had had posted about him. Yeah, yeah, we just 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 ran out this past week. Um, nice kid, and uh, you know didn't hasn't come from a whole lot, but he he worked really hard growing up. He was a little chubby. <laughs> he joked when he was a kid playing basketball, but he always played with older kids and, and even sometimes grown men, college college players, even some guys who have played overseas. That built his game. You know, he's a tough kid. He's not going to not gonna shoot floaters. He's not going to kind of fade away. He's going to attack guys. He's going he's gonna to play through contact. Uh, typical kind of New York City player mentality. You know, he's got that, that mental strength that will serve him well, I think, as a, as a college player. Uh, and he, you know, his shot is, is actually not bad. I think it's a little underrated. Um, but it's just because his ability to get to the rim you're going to see is so elite, better than everyone else on the, on the roster already. And he hasn't even played a minute yet of college hoops. Uh, that his, his shot doesn't seem that great, but it, it is pretty good. It's probably about average right now to slightly below average. And if he can develop that shot over the next season or two, he's going to be a really good all-around player for uh you know a power five school like like Syracuse yeah 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 definitely he I agree with you he looks like a a nice a real nice young player I think uh it's kind of getting to Syracuse future a little bit uh they have some top recruits coming in the next couple years with uh D.R. Johnson and uh and he he said he he was he was going to bring a couple more recruits with him so just so where do you maybe you see the 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 program going in the future yeah, you know, Dior's uh, just saw this week. I'm sure you saw it was as considered reclassifying to the 21 class. Uh, regardless, you know, him showing up on campus is a huge uh, step forward for the program. This is a, a team. He'd be the best recruit since Carmelo Anthony nearly 20 years ago. Uh, he has a massive following. He's an outstanding player, electric ball handler, certainly a lottery pick. Uh, when his time comes, and an NBA player, no doubt, NBA starting point guard, um, many people project, right, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, he's only a sophomore in high school, entering a junior, he's only 16 years old, but uh, the, all the potential is, is absolutely there with him, and the work ethic, and the drive, uh, with Dior Johnson, who just transferred to Oak Hill Academy for this season, um, but yeah, you know, what his what his commitment also means is, is you know, he's going to try to bring some other top guys with him. Uh, who that is remains to be seen, but there's a number of, of top elite talent Syracuse is after in the 2022 class that Dior has been in touch with. Uh, so it'll be fun to, and interesting to see who he's able to bring in the next year or so as far as commitments. In addition to Benny Williams in the 2021 class, they don't have any other commitments in 21 or 22. So um, who, who he brings can go a long way, right? I think with, uh, as you know, just roster building, MBA or, or, or recruiting in college, it's so important, right? Who you're bringing in. You can have great X's and O's. And as we've seen, uh, you just... You need guys who are going to come in and, and not necessarily be one and dones, but stay around, be really good, consistent players. You just need to solidify your recruiting year in and year out to be a uh, to be a top team like a Virginia, a Florida State, a Duke, a UNC. You know, save aside from this past season, those teams have been really consistent recruiting wise, and then it, it it's a direct correlation to their on field you know success and how many games they win. Yeah, 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 but I think uh, 
we, we, we can't talk about the future of Syracuse without getting into Coach Beheim a little bit. I know uh, he considered retiring, I think, uh, a few years back before Mike Hobson had got the, kind of got the job in Washington. So uh, how long do you think he may coach? And uh, just what, what do you think may, may be his timeline and maybe what be what, what might affect him in, in, in his retirement plans? No, you know, that question I think everyone, all our readers and fans and people on Twitter love to ask, uh, you know, what's the timeline? Look, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it'd be a speculation. But from what I've heard generally, it could be after Buddy graduates. But I've also heard, you know, people who have been in the program before say, you know, he won't retire for five to ten more years. You know, so he's 75 now. Uh, he'll be 76 this season, you know, who knows, right? But probably, you know, if I had to guess, I'd probably say after uh, after Buddy graduates or a year or two after that, you know, with D.O. Johnson coming in, maybe that timeline extends a little bit. Uh, this is like, you know, these guys are super competitive. They want to be out there. Jim Beheim's healthy. I think he loves his job. And, and if the recruiting is going to continue to improve like it has the last year or so, you know, he might stick around a few more years. Yeah, I think there's a question that's definitely still on people's minds right now. But uh, to, to kind of get back to you, uh, you're working for the Athletic now, and uh, it, it's been kind of a, a switch of pace. You know, you're going from working at the school and kind of writing game stories and stuff like that to now kind of working at the Athletic where you guys aren't really doing game stories. You guys are kind of doing longer stories. Can you kind of talk about maybe just uh, what has it been like going from writing game stories and stuff like that and working for the school paper to now out there working for the Athletic? Man, it's a, you've hit the nail on the head. It's a luxury for writers. It's a writer's heaven, you know, whereas you can go to a game, not have to write about necessarily what happened in this, this play and, and, and go interview people and, and call it a day. But you get to tr- sort of watch from a, a broader view, a whole 360, and take a step back. You know, sometimes I just put my laptop down and take some notes with my notepad or or, or just kind of take it all in a little bit more and then enter the locker room after the game with a blank can. Uh, you know, what was going through your mind here or, or you know, what happened on this play and get a little bit more, uh, not necessarily always a feature, but kind of more of a feature slash story about the day um, and what kind of went into it or, or a specific player as opposed to, um, you know, like you said, a gamer. And then, you know, no deadlines, not not many word counts, so we can go longer, more in-depth. We have great editors, some of whom have come from ESPN and Sports Illustrated. That helps. And there's so much great talent across the site, as I'm sure you've seen on all, all of our sports, you know, three, 400 writers covering soccer, basketball, football, college sports. Uh, and I, I'm always reading their work just to try to, sometimes steal ideas or sometimes just draw inspiration right uh, what are they doing what worked in this market what, what's an interesting story that could work on Syracuse uh, and, and I'm always doing that as well so we're always reading and the the place just uh, fosters great writing and reporting and uh, organization and just trying new things we, we try to you know whether it's quizzes or surveys uh, long features quirky features uh, fun things, timelines, it all uh, uh, helps us in, in differentiating ourselves. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you just said. Uh, uh, like I was telling you off the air, I, I, I'm subscribed to you guys. I got a year subscription with you guys. Just being able to go on there and, and see what other people are doing, and just think of other ideas. As a journalist myself, I think that that's, that's definitely good information. But I kind of wanted to get into you with uh, about just how you guys you guys work. Like I said, you guys aren't writing game stories, and you guys and like you said, you guys kind of don't have deadlines. So kind of how does that system work? Where it's like, do you have a uh, four stories you have to write a month or just just can you talk about how that that, that system works over there yes you know as far as no deadlines that's just kind of a general term i mean if, you know of course we have to if the work and turn things in right but it's not like you know we need this by 10 p.m or you know cover the game 30 minutes after you got to have a story uh it's more uh you know can you get this to us in the next two weeks and then it's xyz uh so and that's speaking for, for me i'm sure it varies a little bit across the site um you know generally it's a, right now i'm writing about 10 12 times a month so not every day 
you know, two or three times a week generally. Some weeks it's one time, some weeks it's four times, that there's a lot of news or recruiting or commitments. Um, but in that range, usually two to three. You know, it varies across the site, right? I write, you know, a couple times a week off season, maybe a little bit more in the season. Ken Rosenthal and Shams write a little bit more because they're doing more sources and, and news and, and uh, you know, transactions, GMs, movement in the league and big time news. Uh, so they're writing a little bit more. But most of us, you know, the cadence is pretty consistent a few times a, a week and we're, and we're prioritizing in depth um, over, over quantity and, and writing too much or writing every day. Uh, how how's the pandemic kind of changed things? Uh, just trying to ch- trying to find things to write about. I know the Syracuse season was kind of over already with the with the tournament, and then uh, with them not probably not gonna make the NCAA tournament like you said. So, but how has it been just trying to deal with the pandemic and trying to trying to find things to write during this time? Yeah, you know, it really wasn't too tough, man. Um, started in, in mid March I woke up one day to an email from my editor who sent me like 20 story ideas and so that gave me some confidence and just ability to relax a little bit and just be creative you know if you look on our on our writer pages click on mine click on a colleagues uh, it's we don't write much tied to the games anyway so this is not a, as big a as big a difference as maybe other places would uh, would be you know of course it's it's uh different right we're not used to a pandemic but we're not i think as vulnerable as others we're more resilient because we're we're more feature oriented anyway so it's whether it's stories on former players coaches uh trends uh current features you know recruiting all that you know still exists there's still sports it's just not games uh, and i think you know some of our stories reflect that right we can still ask great questions check in with people make phone calls and write well in a pandemic that doesn't change it's just that there's no games and plus you know college basketball off season is now anyway so that didn't change a whole lot for me it's, it's impacting more of the pro sports that are that should have been happening from april may and june and, and now july uh for me it was already going to be the off season so i was already getting into off season mode with my stories we, we kind of talked about, about how, how college college, 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 college kind of was a great position to learn to learn kind of really probably need on the job, on the job. yourself yourself, yourself graduate graduate in 2019 i believe and working, working at, at that kind of kind of kind of i kind of i think, I think it's the job the job right now right i mean right now right right sorry sorry yeah, no, I did. Got it. Uh, well, I interned at the Washington Post after school, and then, and then I went to the Athletic in September after after college. So, I graduated in May, did an internship that summer, and then I, I worked at the Athletic starting last September. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, with you being so young, getting the job so early, what is something that you've learned on the job that college just couldn't teach you like something that you know like i said we said earlier college kind of tries to put you in the best position but what is something you learned on the job that just you just couldn't learn in college yeah man that's a good question there's there's a lot um from taking care of yourself and finding a good schedule you know that can be a challenge just just finding a, a schedule that works for you whether it's what time you write where you live where you write when you do your interviews uh you know i for example i found i write best in the morning and i do my kind of interviews and less creative stuff in the afternoon or evening um that that really has helped me and uh you know so much other stuff as far as the actual you know craft itself uh and writing and just i think more time to read because i don't have a, a, a course load so that helps i have more time to make calls more time to to interact with fans on Twitter uh, and on other outlets and other, excuse me, social media platforms. So that, all, all of the above there, man, it's to, it's a lot different, you know, it, in one way it's still storytelling and in another way you have a lot more time and responsibility and I think you're taken a little bit more seriously when you're not a college student. Yeah, I have uh, actually one more question for you. Like I said, uh, my, my my partner Rich couldn't be here today, but he he did have one question for you. He just wanted to know uh, what what are some tips for kind of breaking into the business, and, and if not, what are some maybe some alternate routes? Yeah, there's there's a lot that covers quite a bit, um, and you know I can go more specific, but I think just as far as broad strokes, 
folks, I think having a passion for something specific is important, right? Like I knew I wanted to write. That doesn't mean I don't want to do radio or TV later on. Uh, I think I do, but uh, all the skills are, are kind of transferable if you're if you're good. But um, the, you know, knowing this, having a sp- kind of some specific goals in in the in the field helps, right? Like if you want to do what you want to do, beat writing. We talked about Keith, and so uh, you, that's a, that's a really good first step to, to kind of identifying what you want. At the same time, it's all right if you don't know exactly, right? Just keep trying stuff out. If you're in high school or college, do what you're doing, right? You can start a podcast so easily. You can start a, a YouTube channel so easily, and and do videos. You can you can commentate by yourself with a a game. Put the game on mute. Uh, there's, there's just you can write a lot, you can read a lot. The, what, we're definitely fortunate in how much we can do now that I think people maybe couldn't do 20, 30 years ago. We have phones, we can look up, you know, I can look up your background, you can look up mine, I can look up how someone got to where they're at easily, and try to maybe replicate that or steal some, from some of that. Additionally, you know, I would say you gotta work obviously really hard. Nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna. You know, take away from that if you can show up every day and without, you know, burning yourself out. But work, you know, be studious, learn, learn about your craft, do do a little bit more than the internship or job asks, and keep pursuing. Right, you're gonna get a lot of no's. I got 20 no's my first internship experience until I got my my first internship. So I was one for 21, uh, which was not a good batting average, not a good shooting percentage, uh, and you know, it was discouraging, right, to get those those emails back or no phone calls or not hearing at all but all you need is one you know all you need is one to buy we talked about elijah hughes all he needs is one team to like him uh one one franchise one coach to put him in the right spot it's the same thing with a young talent like you like you both you know all you need is one one thing to click so don't be too discouraged from that and just keep being hungry for more information working hard uh eager uh, sending extra emails if you have to, um, you know, picking up the phone uh, is really, uh, I think, important and kind of a lost art. You're doing it now, talking to me, but sometimes, you know, people are hesitant to get on the phone, and it's not, it shouldn't be that way, you know, it's not hard to get on the phone and check in on somebody or, or not necessarily interview someone, but just kind of learn about their, their craft. I did what you did, you know, in college. I would try to track down people in the profession and just learn about how what they do and how they got to where they are and that that was a tremendous help as well i actually have one more question question. i'm sorry sorry. no you're good Uh, uh, this one this one's about you i know you said you said college sports you're covering certain things right now where do you kind of see yourself in the future if you want to stay in college sports i know you just brought up kind of tv and stuff like that you see yourself maybe doing some of that what is this maybe maybe something i think about quite a bit you know uh every day really it kind of fluctuates depending on the day uh sometimes i want to go into broadcast sometimes i want to you know in addition to what i'm doing now sometimes i want to do a little bit more news or accountability in sports uh sometimes i just want to leave sports uh down the line but right now i'm super happy with my job at the athletic it's a dream the way they treat us and the, how much freedom we have to attack stories and and um, serve readers as well. You know, it's I go back and forth about about my next step. Sometimes I want to, you know, pursue some book ideas, uh, broadcast and and more features. But yeah, I could stay. At, I could see myself staying at the athletic for a long time. Hopefully, knock on wood. Um, and just continuing to develop my craft and meet new people, learn about new ideas, and continue to grow as a, as a person and help, hopefully impact others, right? That's our, part, part of our goal as, as writers and, and storytellers is to create, inspire change. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the Athletic's a great job. Like I said, I've been subscribed for a year. I think you guys do great work over there. So I just want to thank you for coming on the show today. And th- thank you for everything, you know. I, Hello. We met down, uh, well, at the, we were supposed to meet at the Miami versus Syracuse game, but you ended up not coming, but we still got in contact after that. So I just want to be a great guy since I met you, you know. I just want to thank you for coming on and for everything. So we had some, uh, some technical difficulties on this episode, kind of going back and forth. He was kind of moving, but again, thanks. I want to thank him for coming on the podcast. 
thank him for showing up. Thank him, like I said, for just being a great guy since I met him. So, again, another shout out to Matthew Gutierrez from the Athletic covering Syracuse men's basketball and men's football. Also, again, I would like to give Matthew a great big shout out for coming on. I would like to say to y'all, please, please go, go find him on the Athletic. He He's great, especially if you're interested in Syracuse or just interested in writing. Matthew, like I read his stories. If you guys follow me, you see I retweet his stories all the time. He's great, great, great writer, great, great everything, great guy. So please, you guys, make sure you go follow him on everything. Read his stories. You can find them at The Athletic. You can find them on Twitter. But, uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next one.